If you've been with us, you know we're in a series called What If? And, and today, welcome to you if you are in the room and you go, hey, I've followed Jesus for a while, or you are in the room and go, I'm still not sure about this Jesus guy. This message is for you. No matter where you fall on that spectrum, there is something here in the words of Jesus. If you've been along with the series, you know that the idea behind the series is this, that what if, what if Jesus really meant what he said? What, what if when Jesus said something and we get to the root of what, what the meaning of those words are, that when we get down to that, what we discover is, okay, if Jesus meant that, then there's a, a huge life change for me or there's an impact to my life and that will impact out into future generations and communities. So what if he meant it? And, and to kind of, those of you that are note takers, the big what if today is this, what if there is grace for that? What if there is grace for that. Some of you who've been around church for a while, you just got nervous. You just got nervous because you're like, wait, we, we, we're just going to talk about grace in this blanket? We'll get there. We'll unpack it, I promise. Um, but before we do, it reminds me of 1995, where we're heading today. Because in 1995, I boarded a plane in England said goodbye to my mom, and one of the last things I said to my mom was this, mom, I will be back in this many years, and I'm not doing what my brothers did. Both of them went to the States for schooling and married American girls. I'm not doing that. That is not for me. I will be back in this many years. Um, you can count on it. And my mom just goes, uh-huh, I love you, son. And, uh, Three weeks, I've been at the school three weeks, and I get a call from my brother, and he's telling me my nephew's been born, and he's going, so how's it going? And I'm like, well, I kind of met this girl. And he's like, well, what's her name? And I'm like, well, I know her first name. I don't, her first name's Cindy. I don't know what her last name is, but I, I can't stop talking to her. A couple of weeks later, we begin this thing called dating, right? And dating was this, this process of going, hey, do we even fit together? Like, is this a good idea? Um, and then dating turned into about six months later, me on the phone with her dad going, hey, Paul, what do you, what do you think about uh, me proposing to your daughter? Which, if I'm him, it's, that's God's grace that he said yes, let's be honest. Uh, especially back then when I showed up at his house with a perm. Yes. <laughs> I would have told me no, for sure. Uh, but God's grace said yes. And uh, then, so that's six months in, five months later. So if you're following the timeline, 11 months from when I left my house to um, being in school, December, we got married. So we had this, we had this wedding in, and by the way, I don't know, man, young, dumb, and in love, that whole thing. It was freezing. It was Wisconsin in December. That's a, that's a ridiculous time to get married. Let's just be honest. Um, and there's ice everywhere. And, and I remember we had a rental car as we were leaving. And I'm just like, oh, please don't crash on the ice with everybody watching. That, that was it. That was it. But uh, here's the thing. So the wedding, so all of that builds to this wedding day, right? And, and on the wedding day, something happens. The event ends... But the identity and, and, and what happens, the impacts of that day in my personal life, even though the event ends, even though there is a completion of the event, those things continue even to this day. So, for example, I had never been called a husband until that day. Right. But when the event ended, when we say I do and I now pronounce you, that's the ending of that formal wedding moment. And what happens from that, everything here had a purpose leading up to that point. But when that takes place, everything on this side changed. There were there were impacts that live long beyond the ending of this event. That same philosophy is captured in the words we're going to lean into today. It's in John chapter 19. 
John chapter 19. The context is this, that Jesus is now on the cross. The, the cross was a form of execution that the Romans used. It was excruciating. It was designed to kill you slowly. It, it was designed to be the cruelest form of death that they could come up with. So essentially, you were either tied or nailed. Jesus was nailed, as we know from Scripture, to a cross by his hands and feet. And, and, and the whole point of the thing was, you are going to die so slowly that you're going to suffocate in your own blood. And so now Jesus has been on the cross for a while. It's coming to the conclusion of his time on the cross. And, and as he's on the cross, arms stretched out in excruciating pain. And the Romans think they are taking his life from him. Uh, crucifixion was designed by the Romans to go, hey, you've done something to us. And so now we are going to punish you and we're going to take your life because we own you. And in this moment, what we've got to capture is, is as Jesus, Jesus is going through this, and the Romans think they are, they are um, in control, there's a moment that happens, and it's in John 19, verse 30, when he had received the drink. So when Jesus had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He gave up his spirit. No one took it from him. He laid down his life. What if, what if Jesus really meant it is finished? Some of you are going, is it Easter? We can preach this when it's not Easter. What if Jesus meant it is finished? So, so, so let's, let's kind of build this out because it has a specific context. The word in the original that he cries out is to tell us die. And, and, and the, the verb form there, telos, um, Pastor Owen and I were chatting this week on just, just the concept of that verb and how it plays out and how in English we don't have anything like it. But that word, that verb carries with it, it is the completion, it is the end point, but it, the, what happens from that point is continuous for all time. It doesn't have an end. So, so while, while Jesus is saying it is finished, what's actually happening is the, the idea behind that verb is that something was created for a purpose. That something was created, it was made for this. Jesus coming had a specific purpose, and what he is saying in this statement is the reason that I have come, the purpose of me being in human form, the purpose of God in human form has been completed. I have carried it to the end. But what happens in that moment, while it is an end, what happens is everything now changes and moves forward and impacts continuously as it goes forward. So, so just like the wedding, where the wedding ended, but the realities of the wedding continue on to this day for me, the same applies in this context where Jesus goes, hey, I have Genesis, when it was said that, that one would come that would crush the enemy's head. From that point, all the way through, before the foundations of the earth, Jesus was crucified. Right? So all the way through human history, it's been leading to this point. When he says it is finished, it's all of this human history coming to a point, And Jesus saying, this is why I came. This was my purpose. This is what it's about. It is now finished. And what moves forward from here continues on. In the next moments, I'd like to talk about what is that continuing on. So when Jesus said, I've accomplished what I came to do, what was that? What was ignited in that moment that impacts you and I today? What are those things that we can sit here and go, now, for the rest of eternity, this is true, because it is finished. What if Jesus really meant it is finished? In, in Matthew chapter 27, it's the same moment. So right before the verse we're about to read, Jesus has now given up his spirit, and it says this. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Catch you up real quick on a little history. There's a temple. God had, God had rallied a nation, and the way the nation... What he set up with them is that his presence would actually dwell with them. They would be the people of God. But the way he would dwell is inside of this temple that he 
gave them the designs for. And inside that temple was this place called the Holy of Holies. And in front of that was this curtain that was extremely thick that no human hand could tear um, and, and, and weighed a ridiculous amount. And so it was a divide between God's presence is there and humans are here. And the only way that humans can access God is through this thing called a priest. And once a year, the priest would go in inside of that curtain into the Holy of Holy, into the presence of God, and and he would offer sacrifice and come back out. So if you were an average Joe, what it meant for you is the way that you access God is you access God through these rituals, through this law that God had given, that if I've messed up, I come to the temple, I come to the priest, I offer my sacrifice, and the priest is the mediator between me and God. When it says here that he gave up his spirit and that, and it was torn from top to bottom, that's significant. It was torn from top to bottom. What it's saying is now this access that had only been granted to humanity through this system and this priest and this law, it's now done away with and access between humans and God is now um, accessible and is a reality. When he says it is finished, what he's actually saying is what's also finished is the law. What's also finished is that there would be this system that you have to go through to be made right with God. That there would be this place that you would have to go to that if you wanted to access God, you couldn't even if you wanted to, you had to go through this priest. He, what he's saying here is, hey, separation is done. You have access fully and freely into the very presence of God Almighty. In fact, he went a step further as you follow the story, and he takes his his spirit and puts it inside of you as a follower of Jesus. When he says it is finished, this is one of those things that continue forward. You have access to God. Verse 52, and the tombs broke open. These are some of my favorite verses, by the way. The earth shook, the rock split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Y'all, that's one of the most bizarre passages in Scripture. That's why I like it. No one can explain it. But what it does is this, that the minute when Jesus says it is finished and gave up his spirit, what was now a reality in human, um, in humanity's existence was this, that death didn't have the last word. Death no longer had the last word. And and in this moment now, these people are raised to life. These holy people are raised to life. And who knows what they're doing for the few days when Jesus, like they're just bouncing around the tombs, right? And then when Jesus is raised, they come out and they're seen by all these people. Imagine meeting your uncle again. That's weird. But what Jesus is getting across is it is finished. What if he meant it? And one of, the, one of the impacts of that for us is the death now no longer holds what it once did. It is not the last word. That I don't have to fear death anymore. Why? Because it is finished. What is finished? Death is finished. What is the impact? Resurrected life. In John chapter 8, Jesus talking about like pointing forward for us in verse 34 says this very truly I tell you everyone who sins is a slave to sin now a slave has no permanent place in the family but a son belongs to it forever so if the son sets you free you will be free that word indeed is completely you will be free completely but you see what he's doing there right anyone anyone who sins is a slave, but he's going slaves, slaves aren't permanent. Family is permanent. When he says it is finished, he is setting us free. Free from what? Free from slavery to now sonship and daughtership, now family. What happened in that moment when he said it is finished? You transferred, you transferred from this this temporary slavery to now sonship. Why? Because it is finished. Not something you did, not something you earned, not something you worked your way into. Jesus says it is finished. And the outcome of that, the the impact of that in your life is that now you are no longer a slave to this thing called sin. And we'll talk about that in a minute. You are now a son and a daughter of the king. And that's for all of eternity. 
Why? Because Jesus said it is finished. What if, what if we take Jesus at his word? So, the, so as, as this now unfolds and moves forward in the church, Paul's writing to the church in Colossae, and he talks about this moment this way. Chapter 2, verse 13. When you were dead in your sins, when you were dead in your sins, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. When you were dead... In your sins. So, so talked about it last week. Everybody's born half dead. What do I mean? You're born physically, but spiritually you're dead. There's nothing going on. The lights are off. What, what he's saying in this moment is when Jesus says it is finished, what is finished is the fact that you are spiritually dead. What has been given is those that were dead in their sins, those that were dead in who they were, who they inherited at birth as a human, what happens in the person of Jesus, you are no longer dead in your sins, but you are alive to God, which now ties back to what we were looking at in Matthew, that life is now possible. That death does not have the last word. That my spiritual death is not what reigns over me. What reigns over me is that I am alive to God. That no longer, no longer does sin have mastery over me. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins. He forgave all our sins. You know, as Christians, we're really good at God forgiving our past. What do I mean by that? Oh, you hang around Christians long enough. Man, back in 1972, I had this addiction problem. And we're great at talking about the past, aren't we? And we're great. Man, Jesus forgave me. But the sin of today, well, we talk about it a little bit depending on what it is and if we can sanitize it enough for you. But you know, when it says all sins, it's talking about future. It's talking about when you step into tomorrow in sin, it's already forgiven. I, I, this language hit me. I was kind of, it was two in the morning last night and I was kind of in that weird, like I'm asleep, but I'm not. And I'm thinking about my message and that kind of stuff. And, and I got thinking about this process of we go to God, right? We sin and guilt gets over us. It washes over us. We go to God, God, I'm so sorry. Like, would you forgive me? And you know what God's answer is? I forgave you. It's not, I forgive you. It's, I forgave you. God looks at it in the past tense. Why? Because he said way back, it is finished. It was at that point that rescue came. It is at that point that forgiveness came. You realize that from that point of the cross, all your sins were future sins. And he forgave us all of them. Why is this so pivotal? Because so often we live in this cycle of I sin and I come and I beg for forgiveness and God must look at us and go, did you not understand that I meant it when I was on the cross and in excruciating pain on your behalf and bleeding out that I went, it's done. Y'all, your sin is forgiven. Here's the part and we'll talk about this in a little bit. We, we freak out about that. You know why? Well, John, you can't tell people that because I'll just keep on sinning. John, you can't tell. What's the other alternative to that? That's, That's us controlling their behavior. Well, if God himself, when he says it is finished, doesn't control their behavior, why in the world are we and the church trying to control people's behavior? Because if you read right before that, what he did is he made us alive. He set us free. And if you are free, who the sun sets free is free completely. Your sins are forgiven. So, so what does it look like then, John, when I, when I have genuine re, re, remorse, genuine conviction over what I've done? Man, man, then I go to God and I thank him for the grace that's there. 
You know, repentance, we think repentance is, is the same thing as penance. Repentance and penance are not the same thing. Repentance is I acknowledge and I turn away. What am I doing? I'm aligning myself with you. So when I repent to God, I'm aligning myself with, wait a minute, that does not own me. I'm aligning with God. I don't want to live this way. I'm aligning with God that I'm forgiven and there's grace and I'm going to walk in that. Penance is I understand I did wrong and I keep trying to pay for it. And what Jesus is saying is it's already paid for. It is finished. Having canceled. So if that wasn't enough that your sins are forgiven. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away. Nailing it. Nailing it to the cross. When Jesus hung on the cross and he stretched out his arms, you hung with him. What hung there is all of your debt before God. Think, of, think about it this way. Um, I have a mortgage on my house, but Matt over here decides that, that he's going to go pay my mortgage tomorrow morning. And so Matt goes and pays my mortgage in full tomorrow morning. But here's what I do. Tuesday morning, so that's Monday, Matt's gone in and paid. Tuesday morning, I go in with my mortgage check. And I go to the company and I go, hey, I'm here to pay my mortgage. What would they tell me? We can't accept that because it has been, you do not have a debt anymore. What is being said of you in this moment is that when Jesus hung on that cross and he stretched out his arms and he went through excruciating pain on your behalf and he declares it is finished, what is finished is your debt to God. It is paid in full. There's nothing left to pay. So here's how ridiculous it is when we try to live by religion and trying to gain something. God's going, why are you trying to pay your rent? I already paid it. You're already completely free standing in the presence of God is how he views you as a follower of Jesus today. What's crazy with this is the way faith works. And we want to say, well, it's a prayer and you got to ask God to forgive all your sins. He already forgave your sins. What it is, is me accepting that this story is true of me and that Jesus took my place and stepped in on my behalf. When that happens, what happens between you and heaven is that your legal indebtedness is paid. You are made right with God. You have a right standing. The Bible uses this term righteous. That you're righteous before God. You have a right standing. I don't know if this is doing anything for you, but I'll tell you what, man. I get to preach this three times today. I'm on cloud nine going home today. It's doing my soul good. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle. He embarrassed them. He humiliated them for the world to see. The enemy and all its powers, the world and all its powers, the flesh and all its powers. That What it says in this moment, when it was nailed to the cross, he made a public spectacle. He embarrassed them for all the world to see. And then he triumphed triumphing over them by the cross. That word triumphing is this, that, that he led a victory parade. And guess who's part of that victory parade? You, me, the church, humanity. What did he do? He marched them out. Why? Because you're a victor. What happened when he said it is finished? You went from defeated to victory. And this is what we have been given in this phrase, it is finished. So then why don't we get it? Because here's what it's saying. It is finished. There's grace for that. Oh, what happened to you last night? There's grace for that. What, what you can't accept about yourself, the disapproval you have of yourself, there's grace for that. You see, the problem is I think we don't understand the value that we've been given. Here, here's what I mean. So, so I got a, an eight-year-old Farah, right? And, and somewhere along our way, there, this thing, this turtle, um, I think it's called, uh-oh, I gotta go. It, it's a pooping turtle, <laughs> okay? And the way this works is 
it sings a song. When you feed it, whatever this food is, it begins to sing this song. Uh oh, I got to go. And then you put it on this toilet and it poops out whatever you put in it. And the sand's like, doesn't absorb, somebody who's way smarter than me can tell me about it, but it doesn't absorb water. So it's, it's kind of this cool moment. Uh, she fell in love with it. So months ago, we're like, baby, you, no. It's too much money. I'm not wasting my money on that. No. Okay? So it's done. Months, haven't heard anything about it. All of a sudden, she goes to a store in town, and guess what's there? Uh, oh, got to go. Right? And she's all about it again. And then a dear friend of ours, um, this past week, Valentine's, gave her some money. And I'm sitting at the kitchen counter, and I can hear a conversation between Farah, who's eight, and her sister, Bailey, who's 10. And she goes, Bailey, it's not that expensive. She goes, it's only two paper money. The rest is coins. <laughs> so I look at the counter. There is a $20 bill, a $5 bill, and then $5 in coins. And in her mind, it's not that expensive. It's just two paper money and a whole bunch of coins. I wonder if we're not the same when it comes to this phrase that is finished. We miss the value of what we've been given. We don't comprehend what we've been given because we don't comprehend the value of what it is. That in this moment when Jesus says it is forgiven, there's grace. That's what continues. And grace shows up in the form of for you, for you, you are free. For you, you will never have to worry again. Does God, is God on my side? You will never have to worry again. Do I need to pay for this? You will never have to worry again. Am I forgiven? You will never have to worry again about your standing between you and God. You will never have to worry again of, do I really have access to God? In fact, he went a step further and, and, and indwells you by his Holy Spirit. And, and here's the thing, like, like we get, there's, there's a nervous effect to this, right? John, you can't just tell people there's grace. They'll just go crazy. What's the other alternative? What's the other alternative? We use shame and guilt and disapproval to control people. That's not the way of Jesus. That is not what Jesus did for me. What I see in the person of Jesus when he says it is finished is he is declaring there is grace for that and I'm not scared of you running wild with grace. But here's the thing. If you've been around Jesus long, you know that the more grace you are given, the more it changes you. The more you begin to go, if God could do that for me, how can I not do this for him? It changes from a, I have to do this because it's religion to a relationship. Remember, this whole thing is about you knowing God intimately. That's why access was torn. That's why you were given free access to the person of God. Why? So that you could know him intimately. Why? Why? So that you could feel and experience the grace of Almighty God. Sometimes we think we're saved by grace and maintained by works. You are saved by grace and maintained by grace. And it changes from religion of I have to do this to how could I not? How could I not? The enemy comes to condemn, to dis make you feel like you disapprove of yourself, to build shame. Romans 8, chapter 1, 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is no condemnation for those who, who are in Christ Jesus. How, how do I step into a relationship with Christ Jesus? I simply take this as truth and go, I'm going to claim and I'm going to stand on that. I'm going to make sure that that's where my faith is put. You're not condemned today. Want to know how this works in my world personally? 
The enemy wants to keep telling me, John, you're a big fat phony and you're not enough. And you know what grace tells me? I'm not supposed to be enough. Jesus is enough. That when Jesus says it is finished, that was enough. And so when the enemy wants to speak anxiety over you, where do you go? I go back to there's grace for my anxiety. And you know where grace will lead me? To a cross, because that's where I got it. And on that cross, when he says it is finished, that means I do not have to carry my anxiety anymore. That's how this works. There's grace for that. What if, what if there's grace for that? How does that change your world? What if there's grace for that? Whatever your that is, even if it's I'm struggling to accept that level of grace, there's grace for that. That's the beauty of this. There's grace for that. And so we're just going to sit. You should have received one of these on the way in. And, and what a beautiful picture. It is finished, and you hold the elements that represent it is finished. But we're just going to sit in God. What does it mean today? What if, what if you really meant it is finished? What is there in my life? What is there in my life that I'm struggling to let grace cover today? And would you take me back to the cross? And so we're going to reflect, and then we'll take it all together, but these next moments are yours just to reflect. Can you imagine sitting in that first meal when Jesus took ordinary bread, and you're sitting at that table, and you're watching him tear bread apart and begin to talk about his body that was going to be given. And you don't get it. I mean, you kind of do, but not really. And then shortly after that, he ends up on a cross where he declares, it is finished. And shortly after that, he rises again in a glorified, resurrected body. And all of a sudden you go, oh, that's what he was talking about, that his body would be given. That's what he was talking about when he said, we need to remember this moment because it changes everything. What you hold in your hand is a tradition handed down from Jesus himself to us, his family, that we would never forget that he showed up with a physical body that God in human form showed up to take my place that I might go free. And he took bread as a reminder. He broke it. He gave it to them. And he said, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. At the same meal, he took a cup. Oh, and these boys knew. These boys knew that any forgiveness came through the sacrificial system. And so blood had to be shed. So they made that connection. But he goes, hey, this is new. This is new. Why? Because things are coming to a completion, but what comes out of this will continue forever. And what comes out of this is that in my blood, there is forgiveness of sins. It's never been possible until right here, right now. We get to look back and just say thank you. Thank you that when you said it was finished, I was forgiven. He gave him a cup. He said, take, drink, do this in remembrance of me. God, we are grateful people this morning. We have hearts full of gratitude that long just to declare hallelujah. Hallelujah that you're good to us. Hallelujah that God no longer does sin own us. God, hallelujah that we're no longer dead but alive. Hallelujah that life's been fully redefined. Hallelujah that you are the God that cared enough to show up out of love and stand and walk amongst us and end up on a cross to declare once and for all, it is finished. Thank you, thank you, thank you for Jesus today. God, as we pause in this moment and we, we respond in song, 
How could we not declare what a beautiful, powerful name the name of Jesus is? God, would you cement in these moments what our spirit needs to carry? And would you remind us uh, that this is the story. And inside of this story, we find grace for all of eternity. Thank you for grace today. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for loving us first. And God, thank you that you are our God and we are your people. And everybody said, amen.